Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us this evening. It's so wonderful to see you and uh, get to talk with artists from across the state. My name is Bobby Ann Howell and I'm the program wrangler here at Nevada Humanities in our Las Vegas office. And on behalf of our organization, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's discussion. And tonight's discussion will be led by uh, Humanities Program Manager, Catherine Quill. For those of you who may not know who we are, Nevada Humanities is your state's affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we work to connect and transform communities by sharing and amplifying the stories, ideas, experiences, and traditions of all the diverse people of Nevada. And we're committed to this mission and staying connected with you even now as we are still dealing with these odd and social times. Um, tonight's program will be recorded and will be posted with the exhibition on the Nevada Humanities website at nevadahumanities.org. And just a little information about our uh, Nevada Humanities exhibition series. It's a bi-monthly program that showcases the work of Nevada artists, writers, photographers, journalists, other creative thinkers and organizations that explore and articulate a sense of place here in the Silver State. And we like to engage people in a dialogue about all aspects of the Nevada experience. And we're thankful for the support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and from patrons like you who love art and everything humanities. Um, tonight, we are also here in our exhibition gallery in Las Vegas. And so we want to acknowledge that we gather on the traditional land of the Southern Paiutes who are the past, the present, and the future caretakers of this land, and who have lived here along the Colorado River for well over a thousand years, extending north and west into the areas known today as Southern Nevada, Utah, and California. Our gallery is located in the Arts District at 1017 South First Street, here in the Arts Square Garden Courtyard in the heart of downtown Las Vegas. Normally, we are open to the public, but during these times, we've had limited um, uh, uh, public space, but now we're open by appointment, so we've had a lot of great visitors so far, and we've been here since 2013, and we usually come together on Thursday evenings to celebrate the opening of an exhibition, and on First Fridays, we like to be part of the First Friday Downtown uh, Festival. Um, so people can see all your beautiful work and listen to uh, the ideas presented here. Um, tonight, uh, we're still experiencing COVID-19 and we think it's vitally important to still dedicate this space and this time to present the work and give our attention to each other and the presenters. So we really appreciate your willingness to meet with us tonight. You can view this exhibition online and so please visit it also at our website. Now tonight, we're lucky to have um, this moderated by Kathleen Crow, and I'd like to introduce you, my friend and colleague, who has curated uh, the Wonders of Nevada Creative Workshops as part of the Nevada Reads 2021 series of program events. She was a longtime resident of the Midwest, and she moved to Las Vegas in the summer of 2019. She works here as a program manager, and you may know her best from her work managing the Pandemic Reflection Series, Humanities Heart to Heart, and our Center for the Book Literary Programming. Although more than half her time has now been occupied by the pandemic, she loves connecting to people around the state as a way to continue to learn about her new home through the online work at Nevada Humanities. She's completed her doctoral studies in Utho Musicology, did I say that right? I hope so, at Indiana <laughs> University, where she studied cultural heritage and musical archives in Mongolia, amongst many other diverse interests, such as music from the Flathead Reservation in Montana, video game music and fan communities, and the psychology as of music. She is passionate, passionate about cultivating and promoting the significance of humanities in our over everyday lives. And you might want to check out her video on YouTube where she had an interview with Folkwise about video game music and the humanities. It's pretty fun. So check it out. 
I now want to turn this over to Kathleen, who's going to lead us in what I hope is a really fun discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby Ann, for that kind introduction. And then thank you, too, for all of the artists who are here with us today. Um, I just asked a few from our exhibition series, um, just because I thought, you know, it'd be wonderful to have everyone, but it might be difficult to wrangle, you know, 20 people and have them all in the same space in the, in the space of an hour or so. So um, I'm thankful for everyone who was able to dedicate this evening to join us, as well as our audience members today. So what I was thinking for tonight is to just get to know our artists a little bit better, get to know a little bit more about their work, what inspires them from, you know, Nevada nature, nature and landscape. As Bobby Ann mentioned, um, you know, I haven't been in Nevada terribly long and you know, a lot of that time has spent uh, you know, inside in my house or apartment variously. And so one of the things that I've really enjoyed is getting to see more of Nevada through all of this artwork. Like I learned so much during our creative workshop series about you know, weather and climate up north, um, what sagebrush looks like. I haven't seen too much of that sadly, even though I live down south, um, about Joshua trees and bristlecone pines. So that has just been a really lovely way of opening up my eyes to, to more of Nevada. So um, for those of you in the audience, um, you know, we would love to take your questions. So please feel free, you know, as we're chatting, uh, stick your questions in the chat. Um, if I'm able to, I'll try to weave them in organically. Otherwise, um, we'll save a couple for just the end of this conversation. All right, so I thought I would begin with just a fun question um, after introducing our um, artists. So when I, I'm gonna introduce our artists and share um, a quick slideshow of their work, just so you can see um, what it looks like in our exhibition series and learn a little bit more about um, what they were teaching us during the workshops that they led. So I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, so we'll begin with Tia. So Tia Flores was actually our first workshop leader, one of the first people we approached for the series. So I'm very indebted to her for her guidance during this time. Um, Tia is a fourth generation Nevada native. She is known for her culturally themed pyrographic Calabaza sculptures depicting the vast beauty of the Nevada desert and its natural inhabitants. As an internationally recognized artist, Tia's artwork has been featured on HGTV's That's Clever, Voices of America, PBS Reno Artifacts, and Women Artists of the Great Basin by Mary Lee Fulkerson. Spurred by a desire to know more about her heritage, Tia's designs are a reflection of her two families. From her maternal grandmother, her work captures the untamed characteristics of the Nevada desert. And from her paternal grandmother, she incorporates the rich cultures of the Aztec and Navajo people and their love and appreciation of nature. And for her workshop with us, Tia taught us to better appreciate the lines, shapes, textures, and patterns of nature. It was a very fun workshop. All of them have been. Um, and here are just a sample of images from our time with Tia. One, another one of our wonderful panelists is Candace Garlock. Candace Nicole Garlock is an artist working in Reno. She is a professor of art at Truckee Meadows Community College in Reno, Nevada. She's a board member of Rocky Mountain Print Alliance and her work has been exhib exhibited both nationally and internationally and occupies such prestigious permanent collections as the Boise Art Museum, the Corcoran College of Art and Design, Rutgers Center for Innovative Print and Paper at Rutgers University, Southern Graphics Council Archives, the Kinsey Institute, National Taiwan Museum of Fine Arts, and Painting and Sculpture Museum Association in Istanbul, Turkey. Candace has been awarded the Distinguished Nevada Arts Council Artist Fellowship in 2009 in the 2017 Nevada Region's Creative Activities Award. Her work can also be seen in 100 Artists of the Male Figure by E. Gibbons. During our workshops with Candice, we learned how to do gelatin prints and there are some wonderfully detailed instructions online, which you can still find if you're interested in learning how to do this. And I love just seeing how you took the images that you created during this workshop and wove them into your piece that you submitted as part of this exhibition. Um, and down here below in the bottom right, that's a sample from one of our workshop participants. Um, so she took what Candice turned us, taught us and created this, these beautiful images of plants using printing. So next up is Sydney Teske. Sydney is a self-taught pastel painter who makes plein air landscapes as well as large studio pieces. 
She often sketches with watercolor when out in the field. And to change things up a bit, she also makes books out of found objects, such as broken musical instruments, and translates her love of petroglyphs into furniture. And during Sydney's workshops, we worked with watercolor, um, and we learned how to create clouds, which is for me, it's a terrifying subject. So for Sydney gracefully led us all through how to create, you know, beautiful skies, moody skies of clouds. Um, these two images are of um, art that participants created during the workshop and after and shared them with us. Aaron Hertel was born in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, his father's job as an exploration geologist moved the family between Chile, Bolivia, and Reno, Nevada. Aaron attended the Savannah College of Art and Design in Savannah, Georgia, where he received his BFA in illustration in 2002, and he later received his MFA from the University of Nevada, Reno in 2009. Interested largely in environmental issues, his work, his work consists of both landscape and figurative work. He's displayed his paintings in solo and group exhibitions across the United States, including Tilting the Basin at the Nevada Museum of Art and Match at Oates Park Art Center in Fallon, Nevada. He received the Nevada Arts Council 2012 Visual Arts Fellowship Grant, among many other awards. And currently you can find him as an adjunct professor in the Department of Art at the University of Nevada, Reno, and as a working artist. Um, Aaron is also our most recent workshop leader. Um, these are the images um, that he created during his time with us, as well as sort of a fun um, painting in progress that you can see during our workshop. So you can see how that painting became the one in the top right corner. Our next artist who is with us today is Kristen Muser. Kristen has been painting the land for many years throughout California and Nevada. She currently teaches online Zoom workshops on essential landscape elements, including cacti, mushrooms, flowers, waterfalls, creeks, lakes, rivers, hills, mountains, cliffs, journal page design, and more. She moved to Las Vegas in 2018, where her fascination with the desert landscape has flourished in nearby Red Rock Canyon. Her workshops focus on nurturing a deep connection to nature through the ability to see through skill building exercises, including color mixing and unique exercises that demystify the art and science of drawing, painting, and writing. So at the end of this month in September, you have the opportunity to join these nature journaling workshops with Kristen. I am so very excited. You can see an example of one of her nature journals here found in our um, exhibition gallery in uh, Las Vegas. Um, and then there's also a fun sort of QR code that you can scan with your phone if you want to flip through it virtually instead of having to do it uh, physically with the actual journal. And certainly last but not least is my fabulous colleague, Bobby Ann Howell. So Bobby Ann is a visual artist who has long been inspired by nature, the landscape, Nevada's unique beauty, and the ongoing struggle and celebration of women and children across the globe. She has been privileged to teach and share many experiences working within the cultural community. Her studio, Best Arts for You in Las Vegas, where she works and teaches. And you can find her artworks included in exhibitions across the West and in many public and private collections. And I'll add that Bobby Ann is going to end our calendar year of creative workshops in December. Um, so just look forward to hearing back from us when uh, we have that date and um, topic planned. So as you can see, we have quite a wonderful range of artists with us today from just across the state working in all these different mediums. Um, we see pastels, printing, line art, watercolor, so much more. Um, so what I wanted to ask all of you first was, you know, are, are there any particular places in Nevada or features of our landscape and environment that influence your work? And I'm asking this just because you come from such a wide range of places in our state. So I'm just curious to know, like, if, you know, there are certain features up north that maybe you don't find down south that influence your work or if during your travels across your time living here, if you've just sort of been inspired by um, our state in general. So I'm just going to to call on Aaron, I'm going to have you start first. So if you don't mind answering that question. Um, I don't know if I have a particular place necessarily, but I'm really interested in uh, like the depth, like how, how wide and open everything feels. Uh, so I think oftentimes that is something that I sort of look for when I'm out kind of collecting reference. Um, and I've always wondered, I, I moved to Georgia, you know, for school, and I felt very hemmed in, surrounded by green trees everywhere. And I couldn't tell how far away things were or 
didn't, you know, couldn't really use compass directions because I didn't have any mountains to reference where I was. And, and I've always kind of thought maybe that was like returning back here. Um, that's why I like that, like that depth. It feels more open where I found myself kind of missing that for this, you know, the four years that I was in Georgia. So. Yeah, I certainly remember seeing that during your workshop when we were sort of focusing on how to create this depth of space, you know, between the foreground and the background. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Kristen, if you don't mind. I'd love hearing more from you, especially since you do such great work with your, your nature journals. You know, what places or features in the Nevada influence your work? Thank you. Yeah, um, so I moved to Las Vegas in 2018. And um, I, don't, I live fairly close to Red Rock Canyon. Um, um, painting for me is, is um, really a way to connect with nature as well as I do love to do it. But just the, I, I've always paint outdoors um, except for when I'm doing Zoom workshops where, where I work from photographs. But um, I love to be outdoors in Red Rock Canyon and um, scouting for water and wildflowers and birds and um, settling down and really spending um, you know a few hours working on a page where I take in um, a um, miniature landscape and details of um, plants and sometimes uh, a bird or other animal. Um, so it's, it's just a ripe place for me to spend time outdoors. Um, in the past, I did a lot of um, pastel painting uh, in plein air. And, um, but over the years, I've kind of settled in on these uh, journal pages um, because I really enjoy writing as well as the painting. And so um, it offers me the opportunity to really combine the two um, and, and create kind of a story on, in my journals. So um, I haven't spent a lot of time in other parts of Nevada, um, except in the southern part. So um, I'm looking forward to going north more. Um, I, I, I do travel that way when I teach up in the Sierras. Um, and so it's, it's just a beautiful state. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here. So. Yeah. Definitely. You know, it sounds really lovely. And, you know, as you're speaking, you know, of your work painting outdoors, it reminds me very much of the work that Sydney does. So Sydney, I don't know if you don't, would you mind chatting about sort of your inspiration with, you know, painting outdoors and, you know, just sort of based off what Kristen just said? Well, um, I also am a plein air painter. I paint outdoors, except for when I can't, you know, when the weather is horrible or, um, can't see anything, or I do a Zoom thing. <laughs> um, I ordinarily don't use photographs to paint from. I just work from nature. I tend to paint wherever I am. And I keep a studio in the back of my car, and I'll drive someplace and stop my car and pull it off the road so nobody hits me and um, set up and make a painting. I don't generally return to a place to make to work on the same painting over and over again, which a lot of landscape painters will do. They'll, they have ways to do that to uh, oil painters, especially I, I like to paint in one shot. So I'm limited for time because the light moves and the sun moves. Um, the things that attract me are the kind of everything. I love the shadows, you know, so mornings and evenings are good times or late afternoons are better times for me to go painting because the shadows are better then. Um, but there are places where, uh, like in a heavily forested area where it, shadow doesn't really matter because it's in shadow quite a bit. So you can paint in the middle of the day, you know, it kind of depends on where I am. So um, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. I feel inspired, you know, when I, 
again, I've, I've also only spent time in a southern part of the state, but I have this sort of dream of just kind of driving up north without really having a plan and just stopping whenever I feel like it to, to paint or just sort of relax amidst the great outdoors. It sounds really great right now. <laughs> so thank you. Um, Candice, I'm curious about your work. So I know your work best through the prints that you demonstrated during um, our workshop, but of course, you know, this is something you can't exactly take outdoors or it'd be a lot more difficult, but I remember you taking a lot of outdoor elements such as um, the little helicopter spinnies, which I don't remember the name of Bobby and I think you might have remembered, but no. <laughs> maple, <laughs> just maple seeds. I think they were the maple seeds. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to tell you, it is funny because we were just talking about identity in my printmaking class and with the Nevada, the, the um, PS I love you Nevada postcards because my whole printmaking class is working on that. And we were talking about, um, I, I grew up in Elko, Nevada. And, it, and we were talking about how when you're in a space in a place, you just take it for granted because you grow up in that space. And we were, and we were talking about the um, bighorn sheep and how I was like, yeah, there's bighorn sheep everywhere. Like you just go up the Moyle Canyon. And, it, and yet a person who comes into the state has a whole different viewpoint of, of Nevada and, and space than we do. Like we just take it for granted. Like, I, and it took me leaving Nevada and then understanding how much Nevada, what it meant and how my artwork was influenced by, um, you know, like not the landscape, but the space, mm -hmm. like what Arne was talking about, like mm -hmm. how there's just all of this space. And then I think also us growing up in Nevada, we see so much color in the desert that other people just think it, or, is brown. Like they just don't even understand why we love Nevada so much because we see it. They don't, they do, do not see it. So so yeah, my work isn't landscape, <laughs> like none of my, I do not have a lot of landscape, landscape work, um, but it is influenced by, by place, by Nevada. So, and, and printmaking, that was, there's just the one fun thing that we could do in an hour for printmaking was the gelatin. We have done the gelatin printing outside with a lot of children during our town, so it, it can be done outside. <laughs> yeah, I remember your stories. Lots, lots of paint. <laughs> Certain lots color. Of paint. Yeah. <laughs> So as you're speaking about sort of, we're, we're talking about spaces and landscapes. Um, Tia, I'm thinking about you and your work because I know that you're often um, inspired by animals too. You have a lot of animals in your in your work. Um, and um, before we started this webinar, you sort of mentioned sort of animals coming down to Reno. So this is sort of a combination uh, whammy to question about you know what inspires your work, but also if you can talk a little bit more about um, sort of the, the living animals that inspire your work as well. Uh, yeah, so I grew up in Southern Nevada and uh, actually grew up um, uh, off of Jones uh, when it was a dirt road. Uh, so those that live in Las Vegas know that it's, so anything beyond that, north of that was just open and it was open to Red Rock Mountain. So it's nice to hear about Red Rock. And at that time, I think I was about 10, 11, and I got my first motorcycle, which was a Honda 50. And my brother and I would go out almost every day um, to Red Rock. And that was before it became a, a state park. So we could just uh, go through there. And I fell in love. I think it really influenced my art in the sense that I love the design, the lines and the contrast, the, the shadows and, um, and how they interact with one another. But also, you know, during that journey, as you, as you go out there, you come across a lot of creatures um, you know, the desert tortoises would just, you know, go wild out there and the horned toads and the lizards. And, you know, I'm always drawn to the textures and the patterns um, and sagebrush. Oh, I can't wait for you to go out and just get a sense of that sagebrush. And there was a stuff that was called Mormon tea. We would do that, but really interesting lines and stuff. And I think it, for me, even though I've lived in Reno most of my adult life, I think the biggest influence I had was the, the Nevada landscape down there in Southern Nevada. And I agree with uh, Arne and, and uh, Candace. It's the, 
it's breathtaking as you travel from northern Nevada to southern Nevada as you leave Tonopah and there's just those different layers of mountains and you can really see the depth of this beautiful beautiful state um but yeah it's it's great yeah so thank you mm -hmm. And Bobby, and you, you know Tia well, and you also grew up in, in Southern Nevada. How was your experience uh, maybe growing up here when you were younger? How did that shape your work today? Well, I grew up in Lee Canyon, which is outside Las Vegas at about 9,000 feet. And so we also came into the valley every week for shopping, church, groceries, um, lunch at Kentucky Fried Chicken, and to harass the crawdads at Fantasy Park uh, before we headed back up the mountain. So that change from high pinion, uh, high ponderosa pines to the pinion pines, to the scrub pines, to the Joshua trees, to the creosote, and seeing that vista as you come off the mountain, uh, looking across to what is the sheep mountain range, uh, is just a, a part of my everyday experience, the lights always changing. Uh, I love alluvial fans and all the colors that spill out from the mountains as the, when the water rushes out and, and deposits those colors across the desert. And as the light uh, falls across there, um, where Tia rode her uh, motorcycle, we rode horses uh, when we uh, moved uh, into town and it's been a lot of time on horseback you know, before I had to worry about traffic crossing to get up into Red Rock and around places that I'd have to truck the horses now if I was going. And of course, you just see things differently when you're walking or riding and uh, just interested in that uh, and just getting outside to, to do those things. Um, so those have always been an influence for me. I love pattern and the color. Of course, I went to graduate school in Illinois, Aaron. So you know, the green uh, was <laughs> like that green that's everywhere that encases you. Uh, I was fortunate enough to live not too far from a bluff that overlooked the Mississippi River. So I could at least get up and see a vista because I thought, man, I need some color. I need some space. I, I got to see some air. And what am I doing living this side of the Mississippi? Uh, <laughs> uh, so it was one of those things when you come back to Nevada. And I think if you especially if you look at our state uh, from a satellite view, take a Google vacation, the colors and the geology of Nevada is just really stunning. The, the cross contours on all our mountains from the eons of years past where the water recessed and carved those contours across every mountain uh, back when the ichthyosaurs were swimming above our heads. Um, I just love all those shapes and you'll see them pretty much everywhere creeping into my, my work as, as well as those tiny little desert bees in the desert crust, which I'm also a huge fan of the desert crust and wish that it was recognized as a national forest like other spaces because it's, it's so unique and beautiful. And when it's scraped, it's, you know, it's gone, uh, I guess until we have another volcano or something. Um, so, <laughs> so I don't know, all those things are important and, uh, T and I lived at a, a great time in the Valley when it was really still a small town and, you know, you could take off and just be out in the desert and, and just explore things and, and kids still do. Although some years back I was artist in residence at the Discovery Children's Museum and I had to bring in a friend of mine from, uh, the, the Nevada Forest Service let me bring in some of their horn toads because we just had I just had kids who hadn't like seen a horn toad because they weren't out playing in that their neighborhoods were different uh, they were more urbanized and just hadn't been out uh, to explore that and you know fill a jar full of ants and wait for your horny toad to eat it and, you know <laughs> just hadn't done those things so I just wanted them to be able to look and, and spend time with those kind of creatures. Because once you do, I think you care for them more. And even though some people think of our, our landscape as a wasteland or Mars, which Brian, all those, when we went to Mars, they kept comparing Mars to Nevada, which was making me nuts because, you know, we are a living place and beautiful. Not that Mars isn't beautiful, but 
but we're awesome. I, I agree with you, Bobby, on, on that last point and other points that you made as well. Um, I, I love hearing, um, you know, how you you and T are sort of describing how space has changed over time as Las Vegas has grown and developed. Your stories of spending outside when spending time outside when you were younger, and you know, which is something that we don't see a lot of kids doing these days. And it kind of brings me to sort of like a more serious um, sort of state of mind. And I'm wondering, you know, as we're sort of entering the, the umpteenth month of the pandemic, you know, as we hear news of wildfires and drought um, and sort of other natural disasters in other parts of our country. Um, I know we often speak about, you know, the, the, the beauties and positive natures or positive aspects of nature. I'm just wondering if through your work, um, any of you, if you ever think about, you know, particular messages that you'd like to, to send about, you know, climate change or the importance of conservation, um, like through your work, do you see any sort of change taking place? So I, I just love to hear um, from some of you about, about that. I don't know if it's someone like to go first or if you'd like me to, to call on you, but go ahead, Kristen. Oh, you're muted. Um, I just wanted to mention, I, I do a di another kind of artwork and um, I did a recently did a, um, it's, I call it abstract sewing, it's what I do indoors. But I did, but I did a series on um, climate change, which um, uh, was the five elements of uh, climate change. And um, each piece was, um, ha had a, a one aspect of it, which would be um, fire, water, you know, floods, um, tornadoes, and um, also this sort of overarching earth, as well as this kind of a spirit or conscience. And um, I'm finding myself more and more wanting to um, express feelings about um, what, what I see happening. Um, that's one thing, but also I just think nature journaling in general is a way to honor the earth and um, and um, just hold it dear while as it's here for for us and how nurturing it is and how important it is for us to um, protect it as it protects us. For the most yeah, part. absolutely. <laughs> Go ahead, Tia. Uh, yeah, you know, growing up in the uh, in Southern Nevada in the '70s, uh, there was a commercial, and uh, you know, keep um, don't pollute, you know, um, and there was, a, a chief Dan George, uh, he was the one. And I don't know if people remember, but he'd have a tear come down his eye when there was pollution and stuff. And I remember that sticking with me as a kid. Um, and he has a quote and I'm probably going to destroy it, but basically a part of it says is what one does not know one fears and one and then one destroys. And I always thought, well, you know, as as artists, we're kind of record keepers of of the earth and of the creatures here. And to to share that, um, you know, uh, those creatures with them. One of the things that I love creating are uh, snakes. I love the patterns of snakes, and I know snakes just freak people out, but um, I, there's just something beautiful about that. And I think. You know, as stewards, we we have almost a responsibility to share, you know, to share that with others so that they appreciate it and see these things as, a, you know, a thing of beauty and not something to fear and destroy, you know. And I think about that as as creatures as well as as our landscape and and our earth. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you for for sharing that. And I just, you know, I'm. As you're all speaking, I'm thinking about all the various workshops I've taken with you or have yet to take and just sort of what you said, having that resonate with the type of activities and, and topics we were focusing on. So thank you. Bobby, and you have your hand raised. Well, I just was thinking about what uh, Tammy was saying. And, you know, here we have um, a lot of desert landscaping, which is I call anti-desert landscaping um, because, you know, they they tear down what is beautiful plants that live here, like the creosote bush, mm -hmm. which is a highly resilient, you know, is so fantastic. It never it loses its tap root. It blooms every time it rains and makes the air so fragrant in a different way than the sagebrush does, which is also another fragrant and sustaining plant that we have so many 
sustaining plants like the pinion pine um, that are just so vital to us that we sometimes have to, we're always championing, right? That these are fantastic and please don't discount them mm -hmm. uh, in, in the landscape. And, you know, I, I don't know. It's like when you teach a class about the desert and they will draw a saguaro cactus, which is lovely, but you know, <laughs> think more about like what's around you, what, what's now. And as we urbanize our area um, and I think, Hopefully, one thing that'll come out of maybe the, the drop that we're all in is that we will maybe embrace more of the landscape as it is and appreciate it uh, because we have a long history of trying to turn it into someplace else. Um, and so I always say, when you come to Nevada, you're, we, we love to have you here. We love you to be a Nevadan and we also love you to love it. Um, so take a look at it and um, all the birds and butterflies come through here uh, from across the world, uh, north and south. So eventually you'll, you'll see a friend, uh, a friend of yours from wherever you, they might've lived before. Um, but if we don't keep these spaces for them to stop, we, we won't see them anymore. So I, I know that kind of creeps into my work a lot, especially in my pollinator series, because it's about birds, bees, bugs, and people that we need to be able to freely move and live someplace. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for bringing that up. Um, not to pick on you, Aaron, but I'm just thinking about your work in your most recent workshop where, you know, we're sort of speaking about different colors that you use and sort of the atmosphere that you try to create. And I think at one point someone said something about like the, the skies and the, the air that day. And I'm just wondering like if you find that your work is being impacted as well by sort of what's going on currently, but also has in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always a, I've always had a weird time figuring out how I talk about this because I mean we've been in northern Nevada with all the northern California fires we've been in smoke for weeks and weeks and this, so this is the hard part to talk it's I think it's fascinating I think it's weird the, the way that a landscape that you're so familiar with with all the blue skies that we normally have can change like the colors of it change the, when talking about depth, like uh, that you can't see that far, that it kind of, it, it feels very foggy, oceany, you know, like the horizon kind of just melts and, and disappears um, because of all the smoke. And I, I find it kind of inspiring and beautiful and, and strange all at the same time, as, as bad as all the fires are. Um, and so I think I've, I've, incorporated that into a lot of the work of, of taking this idea of like a non-blue sky, I guess, or a non-clear sky and taking other Nevada colors and bringing in that kind of hazy quality. I find that really interesting and that, that kind of um, extreme kind of atmospheric perspective that you get with, with those sort of days. Um, and, and so, so some of it's kind of tricky, like sometimes it feels very smoky and, and like you know, fiery and orange. Other times it, it feels like in the middle of the winter. And oftentimes I'm not really thinking about creating that, that realistic space. I'm thinking about how the composition works and I don't know, using color more subjectively, I think. Um, but it's interesting how people connect to it. Um, I was gonna say along the same lines though, I, I think that it's always a tricky thing being, interested in landscape and being interested in our landscape and then we go through something like we're going through right now and I think you do feel very compelled to take that on more um I don't know I always feel like strange like identity wise like like you go oh, okay I'm a landscape painter now which I never thought I was a landscape painter before until I realized I've been doing it for like 10 years now um but then it feels like to switch gears and start being kind of if, if you start talking about the fires more often, like, is it, you know, am I using it as metaphor for other things, for climate change? Is it literal? Like, am I painting literal fires that are happening around us? So I feel like it's something that I'm, especially this year, really chewing over. Like, I don't, I don't know how it's going to come into my practice yet, but I do feel very compelled to address it somehow. Mm -hmm. But it feels 
if I just paint fires all the time, it doesn't feel, it feels too dead on. Like it feels, it doesn't feel like it has the emotional content that I want it to have. But I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, as you're speaking, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, Sydney, how your work, you know, and your sort of practice of, you know, spending a lot of time outdoors, how has, how has that been affected, um, you know, by, by everything that's going on? And also, I know that you frequently travel um, across sort of the northern part of the state, like how has sort of the past, you know, couple of weeks or months influenced your own work as an artist? Um, I'm sort of where Aaron is, actually. Um, you know, I, I tend to look for contrasts, but I haven't had the contrasts to deal with lately. And um, I'm also trying to figure out where I am with it. You know, in the past, um, one of the things that I have kind of focused on because I live in Tuscarora, you know, I've lived there for a number of years and, and the earth there is torn, <clears throat> excuse me, torn up by mining practices. And um, it's heartbreaking to see what is done to the land that, you know, it's going to take hundreds of years to get rid of some of the impact that mining has done and some of it will we'll never get rid of. And that's sort of one of the directions that my work has gone. You know, the tailings are beautiful, but they're also the guts of the earth that we stand on. You know, and Bobby Ann was talking about how she loves the crust and how if you scrape the crust away, it's gone. Well, what I have is the scrapings, you know, and that's a lot of what I look at. And with the smoky skies that we've had, geez. Um, like Aaron says, it changes. It changes the depths of, of everything. It changes your edges. It changes your horizon. Your light is so different to work with when there is light, you know. So I'm, I'm struggling with that. I've done more, uh, more watercolor work than pastel work for a number of reasons with the smoky skies, but I, I'm thinking in pastels daily as I look at this stuff, you know, and I, I'm just about ready to tackle some of the questions that I have, but I haven't, uh, actually, I haven't been in situ <laughs> long enough for a couple of weeks to, to really get into doing some of that kind of work. But um, like Aaron says, you know, it, it's something that is important to address, and it is a direction that I'm sort of going in, but I haven't quite figured it out yet. Mm -hmm. It also occurs to me, um, Candice, you know, the work that you submitted for our exhibition also is kind of almost like a commentary on COVID-19 at the same time, so I'm thinking about how you took those prints that you created during this nature workshop, while you also um, submit at the same time the, those quilt blocks um, and then you wrote a piece about sort of the birds during this time and how that's that's affected your pandemic experience. And I'm just wondering if you can talk about um, that as well as sort of the question I, I asked previously. It's <laughs> a lot <laughs> about climate change. <laughs> well I mean and get I, unless we go to like climate as a society or um, yeah I have done I started doing some series of prints that have the COVID in there and then these uh, houses. I, I mean, I know a lot of, we're, you know, we think Nevada landscape, but, you know, we have people, we live in cities <laughs> and that is also a landscape. It's also like where we're at. And so what hit me was I, I live out in rural, like it, by Pyramid Lake. And so I get that beautiful landscape, but then I thought, about my family and everything and they live in the city and when we had to um, basically just isolate and they are in their these houses and then all the people that are stuck in apartments and, and so yeah so a lot of and the little itty bitty birds they just you know that's what I was seeing when I was sick and stuff and I was just sitting and <laughs> looking out the window my husband get, got a bird feeder and he just basically that's what kept me going <laughs> during all that was just watching the birds 
but they did trans they i mean they translated i mean i was already making birds but then it was like i started really watching the um, personalities of the birds and it just all comes together i mean that's my work is that way it's just like okay what am i experiencing right now and, and then it gets collaged together um climate change I, I mean, I think it's for me, it's not climate change change because, you know, climate's always changing. The earth is always changing. It's just how people I mean, I'm more interested in how people are changing and, and this whole pandemic really brought out. It brought out some good, but it brought out a lot of ugliness of people, and I think that that is sort of translating a bit in some of my work those quilt the quilt block prints those were really just me thinking a lot about um family and missing family my mom and um growing up in that quilting um environment so mm -hmm. so that's kind of what the quilts are well thank you for sharing that and you know, I'm thinking Sorry about meant ugly. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> Bobby, and I was going to to say, you know, as I sort of mentioned during my my introduction of you, but anyone who knows your work too, you know, you your work often comments on a lot of these very serious issues. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, about your current work, in addition to your Nevada humanities work, um, you know, sort of what what you're thinking about now and how this might all be reflected in, in what you create. Oh, well, so many things are going on, right? We're all almost getting run over with um, just the world uh, right now, which is very affecting. And when, especially as an artist, when you think, am I saying anything useful? Am I making anything to give anybody some respite? You know, what's uh, the purpose of this work beyond the need that I, you know, can't go like a day without making one or two snowflakes because because why not because I can't help it um but you know what might I be exploring uh you know the <laughs> I don't know if I can even talk about it the the current story of the young Indian girl right who was recently murdered and you, you think to yourself why why would you look at a child and 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 harm them and even about the pandemic like our most precious thing the kids you know until we figure out how to keep all our kids safe i don't care what we have to do we just have to do it right so those things are creep into my work um usually in the form of figurative shapes or silhouettes of uh, women and children and just that that kind of universal plight uh of you know how do we find a place to be and to also be able to experience joy and beauty and you know a place to to rest and reflect if we if we want to because it's such a such a privilege so um you know i i sometimes people ask me about those particular things they're like oh because it's kind of a downer but it also is just those things that once you you know you hear a story like that i can't forget it it's now part of me and I don't know, you know, I don't know the, the family, but I'll try to remember her through my work. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, you're right. These stories do, do stick with you. And it's sort of all of this is an inescapable part of what we're experiencing. That, so we can't, you know, hide it. It does, it will come out in some way, whether that's through art or through conversation. So you're absolutely right. Um, I'm just sort of going to take not exactly a 180, but I sort of wanted to to ask all of you as you know, this workshop series was inspired in part by one of our Nevada Reads books this year. Um, I have it right next to me. I always have it right next to me. <laughs> World of Wonders by Amy Nizuka Matatil. And you know, and what I love about this book is that it's it's short and it's accessible. So you can um, you'll find any number of animals and plants and in just a few pages learn something really interesting about them, but also a little bit part of Amy's life history and her story. And, you know, just as all of you are just talking about stories that affect you, your own personal story. Candace, I love how you use the word collage, since I think that's all any of us ever experiences. I'm just wondering that, you know, as you are all tasked with reading this book as part of your, your workshop preparation, but 
Um, you know, what sort of went through your head as you were reading World of Wonders? Um, did you find yourself thinking about any particular plants or animals that um, sort of you were gravitating towards? Um, like if you thought about any stories that sort of came out through your art? So sort of a, a very general open question. You want me to go? <laughs> All right, Candace, I'll start. <laughs> well, it doesn't even have anything to do with my art. <laughs> when I started reading the book, it, um, oh, what was it? It was one of the squids. Or vampire it was squid. The vampire squid. Okay, so this has nothing to do with art, but it has to do with my grandkids and them making me learn to play Animal Crossing. And there's like, <laughs> you catch you catch all these sea creatures, like you die for the sea creatures and then you catch a whole bunch of different fish and all that. I didn't even know what a vampire squid was. So, so it was like when I was reading the book, then I made that connection to the game and it just made it more real. Like that, you know, that all, you know, around the world, there's just all of these amazing creatures. And of course I was introduced to them from Animal Crossing from a kid's game. So, so it, it's not my art, but it is in my life with my grandkids, so. Yeah, no, I, I love that story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing it again. Uh, and Tia, sorry, I was just thinking about that quote that you were trying to share about, you know, knowing names and kind of, you know, what that does for your understanding and sort of empathy for the world around us. So I guess I was about to call on you and ask your thoughts on, on the question I asked, but also whatever you'd like to share. Yeah, well, I found the book uh, extremely, um, I really enjoyed, it, you know, every chapter of it. And I loved how she um, looked beyond the appearance of the plant or, or the creature and took a look at its behavior and its intention. And I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and I enjoyed how she, she wrote that. And I, you know, reading that, it reminded me so much of my mom. My mom was an uh, just a major animal lover. Uh, we had every kind of animal you could think of living, you know, in Las Vegas when we probably shouldn't have had all these animals, but she loved them. And, um, and I, I, I don't know, the whole part of it just really made me, uh, you know, miss her. We had, you know, we had a desert tortoise that we got that was the size of a quarter uh, that we had found on the side of the road. And for some reason he, he was named Stanley, but he was, he became huge. He was a part of our family. She found a, a gray tree squirrel um, where they had graded the road and messed up the den and his eyes weren't even open. And she just nurtured that little guy. And then every time at this time I was an adult living in, in Reno. And every time I would go back home to visit um, she had a cage for him in the middle of the living room. And every time I would go down there, this cage would get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but it, it just, you know, it's such a pr appreciation. And I, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to read that book because it really helped me reconnect and really, you know, um, honor those teachings that I even got from my mom. So, yeah, it was it was quite nice. So, yeah, I, I loved the book. Kristen, I know that we haven't had your workshop yet, but you did mention, you know, a little bit earlier about sort of nature journaling and writing and how that also goes hand in hand. So I'm wondering, you know, what your experience has been and um, just your thoughts on it as well. And you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, I was just struck with the tenderness of this, um, the book of each chapter. Um, the sadness, I was just rereading the octopus chapter of how we can so, um, in our love for uh, a creature that we can also harm them. And, uh, and um, I also really loved how her own life, you know, that it brings, when you, when, um, when you are let, allow yourself to be really close to nature, how it layers into your own personal life. Mm -hmm. And um, I loved her stories about her family and um, just all the interactions. Just, um, you know, I think it really uh, reinforces the idea that we're all one, you know, that we are part of nature, we are nature. Um, and the more that, you know, we can be close. 
I, I often think that um, nature journaling um, really needs both the visual and the, um, uh, the written word to be for the full experience. She does a darn good job with <laughs> the words. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to read the book. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I'm glad to hear it. And if she's a poet, um, first and foremost, I think that does come out in her writing. Um, and you're right, I think, you know, nature journaling and art and her writing is, is educational um, and it's important. And I just see all of these sort of threads of connection as we're chatting. Um, so I'm just going to sort of end with one last question for, for you all. And I know if you want to add anything else after that, you, you can. But, you know, I'm just curious, um, as this again, this exhibition series came out of our creative workshop series. And during this, I've seen so many questions about, you know, where do I, where do I even begin when, you know, I, I want to start painting something outside or in nature? Like, do I look at the big picture? Do I focus on something small? Like, what are some tips you might give? And I understand that all of you are com coming from different backgrounds and, you know, different tools that you use, but, um, you know, if someone wanted to, to go outside and sort of capture something, like what, what advice would you offer them? Um, and I might start with all of your faces, like don't call on me first. <laughs> Bobby and I'm gonna call on you first. <laughs> oh, fine, call on me. Uh, well, what I tell them to start with first is giving themselves time to be there, uh, to be quiet, to just find a space and uh, watch something or observe something. Uh, I was hiking oh, a couple years back and the whole family came tromping by me and only the little boy noticed that I was there. And then he's like, oh, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I'm watching a blue jay battle over a tree. There's a big fight going on about who's gonna own this tree. And he's like, where? And I'm like, well, you you have to first go tell your parents you're still here because they kept moving. <laughs> but if you sit down for a minute, because we're kind of noisy for animals, you'll see them come out. And I said, you'll be able to watch this great aerial battle uh, over this tree, which is pretty exciting um, to see. And he was able to talk to his parents. They all sat down um, for what one kid I'm sure thought it was forever because you know they wanted to get wherever they were going. Um, so just to, to remind them, you got to sit down and give yourself time to look at the clouds. Uh, we here at Nevada Humanities instituted cloud watching Fridays uh, so that we put on the calendar some time to to just you know put your feet in the creek and look up for a minute. Things that we don't often do as much as we probably should in this world where we're looking at screens or our time is being divided in different ways. So giving yourself time to contemplate, to think, to look, uh, you know, to smell, smell a pine tree and go, is it butterscotch, is it vanilla? Which is it? Um, or smell the creosote, just to, I think uh, Fit Corbett, who's also in this exhibition, who did the listening things, also get you to slow down and kind of uh, listening to the different bird songs or bees or just whatever is out there um, that we just sometimes don't take the time to do. Because you do need that reflective time and it's good for you. And also making art and experiencing just putting shapes and colors down on paper or clay or whatever you have is feels good and you, you need to do it. Uh, creation is uh, as much a part of us as anything else. So I don't know, keep a sketchbook, keep writing, keep singing, keep dancing, keep looking, occasionally go to work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Bobby. And Sydney, I'm wondering if you don't mind sharing you know, a few tips or, or thoughts. Well, I agree with Bobby Ann about stopping and taking time and giving yourself time not only to observe but to make whatever it is that you want to make um, <clears throat> but another thing is don't don't try to recreate everything that you see there's so much out there you know you get caught up in one thing and then you notice something else and pretty soon 
you're frustrated because it it's all out there and you want to put it all on this like eight inch piece of paper and it just isn't working <laughs> for you you know so you gotta just cut yourself a little slack only only look at a little bit at a time give yourself time to work on it um and be aware that our materials limit us so we're not going to recreate exactly what's out there you know it, it's just an approximation and and it's okay you know uh, it's only paper it's only stuff it isn't life-threatening if it isn't exactly what it looks like you know if you make a piece of work and you hate it and i do this quite often um, I hate what I've made and I get it home and I turn it against the wall or whatever. And I'll look at it a few days later and I'll go, oh, okay, the composition's okay. You know, it, it, it isn't what I was looking at, but it's okay by itself. It's its own thing. And, you know, that's part of the process is learning to accept your own limitations and the limitations of your materials. So, you know, that's, that's sort of what I would tell people. Thank you, Sydney. Aaron, I wonder if you don't mind going next and sharing some thoughts. Yeah, no, I, I agree with both. I, I think observation is kind of key to everything. And I always like the idea of like, uh, make a big deal out of things, like uh, build a mountain out of a molehill, you know, like uh, if it's important to you, then it's, it's, it's worth pursuing and making big and eight foot by eight foot or a little paint, whatever it is, like kind of nerd out on the things that make you happy and um yeah i'm, I'm trying to i think that was i think a lot of it's been talked about i, I think observation I, I always thought the other one is you know if you're trying to really develop like your skills that sometimes it's best to do that with things that you don't find darling so like paint staplers to try to get better at painting you don't really care about it and but if you're trying to perfectly paint that flower that you love that you might get really frustrated because you're not able to do it the way that you want to but if you can kind of develop your techniques develop your hand your color mixing all that with things that that i don't know you don't care about as much you can translate that like learn the language and then apply it to being more poetic with the things that you do care about um, because I, I think people get really frustrated and kind of just quit um, and stop or, or, you know, keep tearing out new pieces of paper because they want everything to be perfect. And I, I like that idea. Like nothing's perfect. I think no one has your view. No one has your reference. I think if it's, if the work is believable and exciting, no one's going to like stand and look at your painting or, or drawing and compare it to your reference photograph or the, the view that you saw at the time that you saw it, like the artwork is the part that matters. Thank you. Candace, I'd like to have you go next, not just because our <laughs> went, but... <laughs> I know with my kids and grandkids when we go out in nature, I just have them collect rocks. <laughs> and then we literally, we look at, and sticks, sticks are great too. And then I just let them draw those I, 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 it's almost like you are looking at things that are small like little minute things and then you when you focus on the little small parts then it's not so overwhelming the landscape isn't mm -hmm. and so I don't know and I enjoy it too I, I mean there's so many cool things that are little <laughs> when you're out in nature that you know you step on it <laughs> and it's beautiful and so I just have them like kind of collect little things and then draw that. So kids are easy because our, you know, they just will go, oh, okay, give me some paints. <laughs> and then they'll just paint whatever they see. They're the best. But I, I know students get afraid to draw outside. So, so I say just start with small things. I think that's a very good tip and also sort of, you know, channel our, our inner kids and not be afraid to just go, ooh, or you know, I'm just going to make a mess and that's, and that's fine. So I, I love that. Tia, I'm going to go to you next. I guess I would say, you know, um, draw for yourself. Don't draw for anybody else. Just 
you know, do it for you. It's a gift to you to, you know, be in that space, be quiet. I agree with everybody says, you know, take that moment just to observe and be quiet and, and, you know, uh, enjoy the process of it. And, and, you know, there's, there's no wrong answer. It, it's, you know, like Aaron said, it's your perspective. It's what you're seeing. Just, just do that. But, you know, but do it, you know, don't let fear prevent you from doing it. Just, just do it and do it for yourself. And if you want to share it, share it if you want, or just keep it for yourself. You know, it's your sacred, you know, sacred thing, your sacred place, your sacred journey. Um, but yeah, and, and to have fun and, you know, just explore and that sense of wonderment when you're, when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And last but not least, Kristen, I'm wondering about, you know, sort of your tips that you'd like to share for anyone who might be, you know, scared to start, you know, painting outside or doesn't know where to start with, you know, nature. What are your thoughts and tips? Well, um, I, I agree with everyone here. Um, but I think um, taking a moment to take it all in, the sense, the sights, the feel, um, to, to even tap into how you're feeling um, is really important and, and to let, um, be drawn to what's calling you. So, pay, you know, if you're gonna draw something, it's, it's nice to draw something that you, that you feel a kinship with. And so I like to, um, to uh, tell people to, um, you know, you're developing a relationship with this thing and um, you're learning about it as you sketch it. So it's really, um, uh, it's a discovery process. Um, and one of the other things is that I, um, I think helps is not to focus on just one thing on a page that you can, you can, you can do a flower and you can do a stick and you can do a few dewdrops or, you know, or just a few color dots representing the color of a bird that flew by. Um, and then if you, that you can create a whole, um, just a kind of a gesture of, of what your day was like in nature. Um, and also that you don't have to complete everything, that you don't have to do a full leaf. Maybe you just do the edge of a, the serrated edge of a leaf. Um, and then your notes can, uh, you write a few notes about what the rest of it looks like, where, gosh, I didn't quite, these are sharper than I show, you know, so that it can be just kind of an exploration and a relationship. And, uh, Thank and you. I forgot to mention that I also used to always have my students do detailed descriptions of things, right? What is it besides what you're seeing? And that, you know, it's Camille Pissarro has a, a quote where it's about drawing that he's just drawing unceasingly, right? When people ask him, how do I get better? And it's like, just draw, you just have to draw all the time, draw everything, draw unceasingly. And uh, it is, all these are verbs, drawing, painting, looking, seeing, observing, that you have to do it and, and commit to that if you want to get better, or even if you just want to take a big brush somewhere and make a small painting on any given day, but it's all about doing it. Thanks, sorry. No, no need to apologize. You know, so thank you all again, just so much for, you know, spending your time with us. I feel like, you know, we could have spent the entire day, you know, we could have had a picnic and sort of just talked about this the whole afternoon long. So I do hope that, um, you know, I know that there will be more chances for us all to work together and chat more about these, these issues. And again, you know, Chris and I can't wait to take your upcoming workshops at the end of this month. So for those who haven't signed up yet, you know, please do so. You can find more information on our website. And Bobby Ann, I'm just gonna turn it back to you. All right. Well, thank you. It was so great um, hearing from you all today. I don't know if there was any questions that you wanted to get to, uh, um, Kathleen, uh, in case you do. Anyway, uh, we thank you, all those who are listening as well, and that you came to learn about these wonderful artists and Nevada Humanities. Please sign up for our newsletter. Please sign up for classes. Uh, visit our website. That's where you can always see what we're doing. We appreciate your time. And of course, 
your support of Nevada Humanities. I just wanted to remind you, we do have a call out for art. The Nevada PS I Love You postcard exhibition has a call out for art. So it's on our website. We hope to have entries from all across our state about why we love Nevada. So just one more call out and please take care of yourself and each other. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>